so everybody here uh, doesn't believe in global warming or climate change, and um, you all think that vaccines cause autism, and you love Jenny McCarthy. You are on the right panel, because you need to know why you're completely wrong. <laughs> I have a good set of people on the panel that they have somewhat varied expertise, but actually they can speak to these issues quite well. And we'll start with Barbara Drescher, who's been quite a regular this year on the track. I've, I've used you a lot this year. Um, yeah, yeah. How do you feel about that? Good, actually, because well, <laughs> I didn't do a lot last year. I kind of so, took a break last year and yeah, only did a couple so, of things. Yeah, tell me I like about, to work. Yeah, I know. Did, tell me a little about yourself. Um, uh, I'm a cognitive psychologist. I taught uh, uh, research methods, statistics, and cognitive psychology at um, mostly at CSU Northridge for about 10 years, and now I do a lot more skepticism, writing, education, that sort of thing, um, writing educational materials. And the next guy, I have to make a disclaimer. I, I used to work this, with this guy professionally, it's David DeSalvo, and somehow he went from being in the field where I was working, environmental engineering, so now he now blogs and writes books about skeptical stuff. I, I, I blame myself, even though he might not agree. And tell me a little bit about yourself, David. So I, uh, I'm a science journalist. I contribute to Forbes magazine, Scientific American Mind, uh, Psychology Today, and a few others. And I also have written a few books, um, the one you may or may not be familiar with that's best known is called What Makes Your Brain Happy and Why You Should Do the Opposite. <laughs> and next up is Stephen Novella, and if you don't know him, why are you here? Because I guarantee you, every, by show of hands, I bet you every single one of you knows who he is. Oh, nobody knows who you are, so tell them. <laughs> uh, I'm Steve Novella. I'm a clinical neurologist and also um, a, the host and producer of The Skeptic's Guide to the Universe and basically have a second career as a science communicator. And next up is the guy that probably is more popular than, than Steve. Everybody knows Matt Lowry, right? Oh, say? More people know you. How do you feel? Or Sorry, I'm, Steve. How do you feel? <laughs> Tell me all about yourself. Uh, yeah, my name is Matt Lowry. Uh, uh, I have a blog online called The Skeptical Teacher, so shameless plug, check it out. Um, I'm a high school and college physics professor, and uh, I guess the panel's my idea, isn't it? It is your idea. Yeah, it is my so, idea, so you can all blame me at the end. Which is one, this, this is the point where I go, now you know who they are, and because it was his idea, I'm getting out of here. <laughs> Thanks, Derek. And, uh, just real quick, let's give a round of applause to these, to, the, to this setup and the AV people and everything. This is great. They've been working a long, hard time. This is super. Thanks, guys. Um, okay, so uh, since this whole thing was my idea, I'm 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 going to be pretty much moderating this. Um, the the p purpose of the panel is to uh, not just talk about. Uh, uh, denial of uh, evolutionary science and denial of, say, climate science. But I'd also like to be able to branch into topics of uh, science uh, denial uh, or misuse of science uh, by pseudoscientists in general. Um, how does it manifest? How can we uh, counter it? And so on. So I've got a few notes here maybe to get us started. I was reading this very interesting article recently from the uh, National uh, Center for Science Education. And by the way, if you don't know who they are, you should look them up online and consider donating to them because they are an amazing organization. And um, uh, Josh Rosnow uh, had, uh, had recently written this blog post where he was talking about, uh, it seems like uh, uh, the people who we might have labeled, say, climate change deniers, uh, in, in the past seem to maybe uh, at some level be taking a different tack on, uh, on the whole global warming thing. And I, I, I like to summarize this in a, in, a, in a pithy little phrase. It's, you know, I'm not a scientist, man, but, right? And I think the but, as buts often are, is important uh, because it's usually followed by some kind of statement about how, well, you know, I'm not, you know, and it could be in regards to creationism or anti-vaccination or whatever. I'm not a scientist, but 
I don't need to be a scientist to know that vaccines cause my child's autism and so on and so forth. Uh, for example, so um, thoughts, fire away about, about, about that. I mean, have, have you encountered that kind of uh, thinking or, or, or that kind of statement in your interactions uh, with writing, blogging, uh, podcasting, whatever? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think um, a lot, and with these types of issues, there is a robust scientific consensus, and there are people who don't accept the scientific consensus. Uh, and you, it's an interesting question as to why that is. But in, from my perspective, almost every time I talk to somebody who denies evolution or climate change or something else that I consider to be a fairly robust consensus, they don't think they're going against the consensus. They think that they just have a different understanding of what the consensus is. Uh, usually because they are operating within a completely closed off separate world where they are learning everything about evolution, let's say, from what we call secondary hostile sources. Everything they learn about evolution is from people who deny evolution. And they're overwhelmed with this, what I call sophisticated nonsense, to the point where they think that, yeah, it's, it's obvious. Anyone who knows anything about evolution knows that it's nonsense. And you know, scientists don't really believe it. It's a theory in crisis. It's about to, you know, it's on the verge of being rejected. If it weren't for those few atheist holdouts, you know, it already would have been rejected by the scientific community. So they just have a different version of reality because they're, being, they're living in a bubble of misinformation. Other thoughts? I, I wanted to actually piggyback on something that, um, that Steve said, the, the idea of where they're getting their information from. Um, I did some research with a student a few years ago uh, using a large data set. So she was looking at information about how religious affiliation and political affiliation affected views on science in general, but also views on the environment. And it was fascinating because um, across the board, people had concerns about the environment, but the question really had more to do with what those concerns were. Um, for conservatives, they were more concerned about pollution. Uh, for liberals, they were more concerned about climate change. But what was really fascinating about it was that everybody pretty much across the board trusted science. So this idea that, that conservatives distrust science really is, is a bit of a misunderstanding. It's not, that, it's not science they distrust, it's scientists. They, they, get, they trust the science. What they are not trusting is the scientists. So they, one of the questions um, in the survey was, where are you getting your information from? And the truth of the matter was, it was uh, tied to political affiliation and not tied to relig religiosity like the student that I was working with had suspected it was tied to religious affili or uh, political affiliation. Conservatives got their information from sources other than scientists, uh, and that I found very interesting. David, yeah, it's particularly with evolution, uh, you know, the organizations that, as you were talking about, the, the the organizations that feed the confirmation bias, you know, the closed loop that you're talking about, they position themselves as scientific organizations. You know, Ken Ham, who's particularly well-known uh, on that side of the aisle, you know, he, he speaks of himself as a scientist. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people who are using, you know, his, his stock and trade is to arm people um, with, quote-unquote, science to argue against evolution. So the people I run into who, who you know, listen to Ken Ham or others of that, of that uh, ilk, you know, they believe they're arguing from a scientific position. They believe they have evidence that's contrary to the evidence that we would, would say supports the, the facts. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's I, I'm very glad that you used the F word there, David. Fact. I don't know what you all were thinking of, but. Um, <laughs> uh, and that's, that's very interesting because facts are, Facts are often interpreted or uh, ignored, depending upon the case, within the context of, uh, of, of a sort of a, a broader scope of ideology and worldview and so on, I think. And I, I think what, uh, what a lot of you are getting at is, is kind of how, you know, when you talk about how we would view, say, creationists like Kim Ham rejecting the science of evolution, but he doesn't see himself as rejecting science, it's because he's got a fundamentally sort of different worldview. 
um, you know, it, it also goes back to the question of you know who is an expert, mm -hmm. right? Uh, if if you if you are have aligned yourself to a point where you have a worldview where you want to say reject the idea of global warming, and you uh, th then you will call up experts out of the very small minority of scientists to 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 adhere to that view. Um, so. How does that, and, and I'm going to kind of direct this, well, maybe more towards uh, Barbara. I mean, how does, how does that work in people's brains? I mean, how does that process of rationalization uh, work out? Uh, because it's, if, if, if you're coming at it from one, from one worldview and then you're coming at it from another worldview, there's something fundamentally different there. So... Well, it's, you know, it's really the, how you're dealing with cognitive dissonance. I mean, that, that's, the, it, you're really talking about basically a form of cognitive dissonance and, and the confirmation bias, which kind of drives most of our behavior as it is. We're looking to confirm what we already think is true. And some of that has to do with our personal identities. One of the reasons you see these divisions along party lines, um, political party lines, is because we're, we're tied to our ideologies. It's part of our identity. Um, one of the other interesting findings of the study that I was just talking about was that um, people on the left and people on the right have pretty much equal confidence in their knowledge, which is an also fascinating because people on the left say that they get their information from scientists and people on the right say they get it from other sources. They have pretty much equal confidence. And people in the middle, independents, lower. They have less confidence in their own understanding of it, and they rely more on expertise. I think there's a bit of, of anti-intellectualism from any extreme view where you, you're so tied to your ideology that you want to um, support that. And so you seek out the facts, you seek out the, the, the people and the facts, I think, that, that lead you there or that allow you to hang on to those beliefs. Anybody else's thoughts on that? Well, I mean, the thing that struck me is, and I think maybe I disagree a little bit with your overall view in, in that, I don't think anyone except for pra practicing scientists have direct access to scientists or the science, mm -hmm. right? So Yeah, this is actually self-report, so, yeah, so it's, it's, they may, it's where they, they're saying they're yeah, getting Yeah, so yes, they may think that right. they're talking to scientists, but let's face it, you know, unless you're a working scientist, you are getting your information about science from secondary sources. Somebody else is telling you what scientists are saying. Unless you are immersed in the community of science at a technical level where you understand what the hell they're talking about, somebody is interpreting the science for you. And the media generally does a horrible job of doing that. They make a lot of basic mistakes, for, for example, assuming that an individual scientist's opinion is equal to the consensus of scientific opinion. So if they just happen to get a scientist who has a fringe opinion, that's what they present as the, the scientific opinion, for example. Um, so what, you know, to, to, to get back what was already said too, that the, the problem is, is that like the creations, for example, are setting up their own institutions of interpreting the science for the public. So you have the Discovery Institute. They're not doing any science. There's, there are no scientists in the Discovery Institute. They may, they may think they are, but they're, they're really not. What they're doing is interpreting the science for the public. They're an alternate science reporting outlet, institution. And they present themselves as having as much authority as any other outlet that's a secondary source that's communicating the science to the public. So really it comes down to which secondary source are you going to trust? The ones that are telling you what goes along with your political and, and social and religious ideology and that your community accepts, or a different one? And it's really difficult. I'm not, I don't think there's any real easy formula. It's very difficult to learn how, you know, which institutions that are interpreting the science for you to trust. And I honestly don't know how the average person does it without a fairly high degree of scientific literacy and some familiarity with a, a broad range of outlets. And, you know, I have, I, you know, have hard time doing it outside my field of expertise. I mean, within oh, my field, yeah. I can go to the literature. Outside of it, I, it's a lot of work. It's hard work finding, you know, the consensus of opinion. Oh, yeah. I mean, when, when I... I just gave a, a lecture over in the science track, and you know, in preparation for that lecture, I was reading a number of papers. But I mean, if if it's if it's outside the purview of physics, I mean, 
hell, I, I don't know. <laughs> Someone else has to tell you what. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I don't know. But for, but for the most part, the, the media doesn't even get to that level of granularity. I yeah. mean, it's, it's like you're saying, it's who, which, which expert is being, you know, is being brought up that day to right. talk about that, that topic. Right. It's, not, it's not about, well, which consensus of experts or which, you know, which way does the preponderance of evidence lead? It's yeah. what is this person saying you know, in the microphone that day? And then when you try to get to what's the consensus, the problem is, is that the organizations who are telling you what the consensus is are perceived of as political bodies. Right? So the World Health Organization is telling us what the consensus is, or the International Panel on Climate Change. Right? So it's easy to dismiss them as a political body not scientists. And in a way, it's true. You know, it is just another body that is, now if you understand the process, you can say, well, they, there's you know, 500 scientists on the panel and they came to a consensus, but it still has sort of the look and feel of a political organization. And it's very easily spun that way as a way to dismiss it. Well, that opinion was political, it wasn't true. And it does actually happen often enough that, there, that like the World Health Organization will come out with an opinion on something that was sort of politically tweaked. So it, there's a little bit of grain of truth in there, and it's enough that if you have motive, just a little bit of motivated reasoning, and you could find all the opinions you want and good reasons to dismiss all the opinions you don't want. So it's your problem. And, and that's exactly what fuels the Discovery Institute, because yeah. mm -hmm. that organization in particular lines up the PhDs mm -hmm. on their in their brochures and in their, engineering and things. Yeah, 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 they yeah. say, well, yeah. look, you know, we what we have all the experts, yeah. we have experts on their side, they have experts, we have experts. We're, we're no less credible than they are. We have as many PhDs as they do. We have as many letters behind mm -hmm. our names as they have. Right. I'm, glad, I'm glad that the discussion has kind of rolled around to uh, the media because uh, I just want to mention something that happened you know, uh, relatively recently. Uh, how many of you heard about the uh, news about the, uh, the BBC uh, kind of uh, getting rid of this whole quote equal time yeah, the false thing. balance issue. Uh, yes, uh, and uh, uh, the idea is I think we see a lot in the media situations where when there is a scientific topic under discussion or being reported upon uh, in many cases I, I think that the media feel that they have to provide you know these different perspectives, like for example, on, on on climate change, you know, well, we have a scientist here who, you know, is is a they're, they're, they're aligned with the findings of the you know International Panel on Climate Change and so on. But then we have this gentleman from the Heartland Institute, for example, who uh, is not, and and this can provide uh, to the average layperson who is you know, not a scientist, who's not necessarily very scientifically literate, and and so on and so forth. This can provide a, a, a false impression. And there's a history on this. Of, uh, the creationists have pursued for a very long time, so to speak, equal time laws mm -hmm. in, say, public schools for creationism and evolution. And there's, oh, there's so many mutations and variations, and I just love using that to describe it. Uh, but on, on, the, on these, you know, yeah. Yes, thank you. Uh, there's so many variations and mutations on these, on these attempts to get equal time. But it's, it's almost as if for a long time the media by default has done that. Mm -hmm. well, I don't think, you gotta remember the media is um, mostly lay people. Right. So they, they are the audience and they, yet they're trying to decide what the audience needs to hear. So I think, I think part of the problem is that the news reporting has changed, we don't have Scientific experts doing scientific reporting quite as much, you know. There's yeah, a, yeah there's science a journalism of, has declined. Yeah, yeah. And so, it, how are they to know? Yeah, that's, the, that's fair. The, you know, the formula that is applied elsewhere, the journalistic formula of, you know, balance, you know, giving equal time to both sides, of figuring out what the narrative is and then telling the narrative doesn't apply to science. It doesn't mesh well at all. And you, you need specialty training in how to be a science journalist. You can't be a generalist and, and do a good job at reporting science. At least that's what the evidence seems to suggest. And it is, unfortunately, that it's been in decline. The specialty journalism is, is shrinking as the business model is in flux. But that's why we have science blogging, right? I mean, I think yeah. it, it, we have to fill the gap. You know, actual scientists, community Somebody actually to has to actually read the study and not just copy and paste the press release. The press release, yeah. Ah, yes. 
Um, okay, any other thoughts on... Uh, yeah, yeah, you actually, on. you mentioned science education, you know, that the, the, there's some leakage into trying to make it fair and balanced in the classroom I, um, yeah. that's being promoted by, you know, creationists and so forth. And I find that interesting, too, because I think one, one of the big problems is it's just like journalists, a lot of the decision makers in education are laypersons, too. They're elected officials mm -hmm. to school boards. They really don't understand education or what's good for kids, and I see it all the time. LAUSD is, is full of it. The, some of the decisions that they make are mind-boggling because they go against everything that the literature says. Things like homework um, require or homework guidelines, how much homework each student should have at, <coughs> at each grade and so forth, goes against all the literature. And that's part of the problem. We have a political model that doesn't support, you know, what necessarily what's best for us either. Yeah, I think I think that's right. And I think, you know, the state of Texas is a perfect example of, of where uh, 18th century mm -hmm. um, <laughs> ways of thinking seem to dominate the educational system. But, you know, the educators are, you know, who are not scientists, who are in some cases not even professional educators. Mm -hmm. um, they, they, you know, just like anybody else, they're more aligned with what will reinforce their identity. You know, belief and identity are closely aligned. The fact that, you know, it doesn't surprise me at all that um, there's such a uh, alarmingly high percentage of people still in, in positions of power in education who uh, believe in creationism because they, you know, they, they see evolution as an affront to their identity. It's not simply yeah. a, a science issue or even an evidence issue. It's an identity issue. It's, it's who I am, and, and, and by asserting this belief, you're challenging at the very deepest level, you know, who I am as a person. You know, that, that brings up a really interesting point that I wanted to speak to, because I, w I was looking at some uh, polling by Gallup and whatnot and, and so on, because they, they, they track issues like this, you know, what do people think about evolution versus creationism, about climate change, and so on and so forth, and it's kind of interesting. Um, in, in recent years, acceptance of global warming, and more specifically human-caused global warming, has actually increased in the United States. I believe uh, just as, as few as three or four years ago, it was about 50 percent. Now it's up to almost 60 percent, uh, which is a pretty big deal. Um, but creationism is still kind of, the, the whole creation evolution thing is still kind of stuck. Uh, you know, the same number of people who believe that the earth is 10,000 years old or less is a, still about the same now within a percentage point or so as it has been for as long as I've seen Gallup tracking this. So what's going on there, right? Well, why is it that we're seeing this shift with climate science that we're not seeing with evolutionary science in, in the popular mindset? What is happening there? Thoughts? Because I'm, I'm, I'm at a loss. I think there's two things. For, for one thing, um, the creationists are fighting back. I mean, they're expanding. Uh, groups of, of Christians that were you know, fairly conservative, but not necessarily fundamental and not pushing uh, intelligent design are now pushing intelligent design. So it, it's expanding, they're fighting hard. The, the climate change thing, I honestly believe it's because we're actually seeing some of the effects of it now. When it's, you know, people make decisions and, and make changes when they can see the short term um, effects of it. Yeah, I think the, the climate, the fact that climate change is about what's happening in the future and the future is coming. And so we're seeing changes, I think that's big. But also the creationism has a longer time. They're totally culturally settled in. You know, it's the, the, the debate was, this is what, over 100 years old, you know. So uh, I think that we've already settled into sort of a cultural stability there. And again, you're not gonna change the, that deep-seated culture with more scientists or experts you know, saying that evolution is correct because they've already fully entrenched their, their experts to counter anything that, that we would have to say. So um, <clears throat> I, I don't really even, I don't see how we can significantly shift this. It would really need a, a cultural shift. I don't think mm -hmm. that, you know, just correcting the misinformation is going gonna, is gonna to significantly move those numbers. And it hasn't. So that seems to support that. 
conclusion. Yeah, I agree totally. I don't. I don't think we're going to see a big shift in those numbers because it's not an. It's not an evidence-based yeah. debate. Um, creationism is a. Is a. You know, leverages people against a belief, a deeply held belief, and you know, discovery. Is, if you read their literature, they're very clear about this. They tell people, you know, if you believe in evolution, you might as well just leave the church right now because you. You have. You know, believing, believing in evolution is a challenge to the very foundations of scripture. And you cannot be a Christian and you cannot, be, uh, you cannot believe in evolution at the same time. And they're, you know, they're very blatant about that. And, and I know a good number of people who take that very seriously. You know, it, it, well, it's, it's interesting that you're bringing that up because something else that I noticed in, in this polling specifically about the creationism angle is that, uh, is that while the percentage of people who we would call, say, young earth creationists has stayed basically static. There's a little bit of variation. Maybe it's a little bit less, but not much. Um, there's two other camps. And one camp is the camp that says, okay, I believe that there's evolution, but it's guided by God, essentially. Um, theistic evolution, more or less. Uh, and then there's another camp that says, you know, well, you know, basically it's, it's, it's Darwinian evolution and so on. And the same poll, I saw that the camp that would go with, say, theistic evolution is actually growing a little smaller, and the Darwinian evolution camp is actually growing a little bigger. So are we seeing a scenario where things are becoming more polarized, perhaps? Or, or I, I or think what? they are, and you can see that in examples, very high-profile examples. Francis Collins, who, who led the uh, Human Genome Project, who is a, a devout Christian and um, and a creationist, but he got into a little bit of trouble when he s kind of seemed to start falling into the more blurry area between, um, you know, creation by design versus you know, well, could it be evolution by design? You know, maybe it, maybe a creator kicked off evolution. You know, he started flirting with that a little bit and got got himself in hot water very quickly. And it's because hot water with creationists with creationists yes. because because the the organizations and again I'll. You know, I keep bringing up the Discovery Institute because I think of them as sort of the flagship on that side. You know, they they want the polarization to remain. They want that gap to be very, very clear. You know, they don't want to they don't want a gray area there um, because again, their their mantra is, you know, if you if you go over to the other side, the dark side, you go to um, hell. Yeah. yeah, you you are challenging our belief system. And, and any side core. besides our side is the right. dark side. Right. Exactly. No matter if it's theistic evolution right. or atheistic evolution or whatever, it's it's the dark side if it's not us. Right. Okay. Yeah. So to have a to have a high profile creationist like Collins or anybody else start flirting with the notion that maybe we can still have um, we can have evolution by design, that's a big no no. So I think I think the polarization is is being reinforced by a political structure that, as you say, the creationists have been very successful in expanding over the last you know ten to twenty years. Hmm. It's still it's tough though with surveys because it's how yes. you ask the question right. depend, you know, gives you different results, and you know you could phrase the exact same question but from different perspectives and you get very different results. So it's hard to know how much of that is an artifact or just how the questions are being asked. You know, there, there is at the same time in our society, there is this trend towards um, people, especially younger, younger generations, saying that they just are non-religious. Not that they're atheists, they're just, they just don't think about it, it's not part of their life. That's, that's a fast-growing segment of our society. So I wonder like, how much of that shift from theistic evolution to just saying, okay, it's just evolution, is in that growing demographic of people who yeah. are just, they don't feel like they need to hold out the belief of God. And, and, and so, I, yeah, evolution is what's on. Yeah, and I, and I was also wondering, you know, how much social issues play into it. Like, yeah. for example, I mean, the, the big one right now is this is, is, uh, amazing growing acceptance of gay marriage. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it, it has just blossomed like crazy, especially in the courts and so in, in, in popular opinion in the last just five years. And you, you have the fundamentalists, if, if they're creationists, they're probably also fundamentalists on the issue mm -hmm. of gay marriage. And that is leaving a bad taste in, I think, a lot of young people's yeah, people's minds because they're thinking, you know, wow, well, if you're going to be like that about these social issues, and how do I know you're right about this creationism stuff? So maybe that's a, there's some crossover there. It's all it's all mixed up. Um, 
you know, something else that, Steve, you just mentioned that, that, that I wanted to touch on, and I think this is a good point to do it, is you, you talk about the survey about how you phrase the question, mm -hmm. how you word things. And I think this is very important, like, w when you're trying to, say, communicate to people who, uh, maybe they're not, like, hardcore creationists or hardcore anti-vaccination people or hardcore uh, pseudoscientists or whatever stripe, but, you know, they're not literate about things, right. they, 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 they have questions, and, you know, they see all this stuff and they're trying to figure out, you know, like, do I want to, do, do I really want to vaccinate my kids on the schedule that my pediatrician says or not, and, or, or should, is, is there anything to this global warming stuff or not? And I think it comes down to a question of communication. How, how do we communicate to those people, to those, to those right. fence sitters, so to speak, that, that, that kind of, I call them sometimes, you know, the, the muddled middle. And um, I'll just relay a, a, an anecdote uh, from, from my own personal experience. I have, a, I have a friend, a colleague that I work with. He's, uh, it's fair to say that he's a very conservative man politically. And he, uh, he has been a long, uh, a long questioner of global warming. And I have had a series of conversations with him for years about this topic. And I've discovered that if I'm able to separate the discussion from the politics of global warming and climate change, you know, in terms of potential solutions, do we do a carbon tax, do we not do a carbon tax, so on. If I can separate that question from the science of whether or not it's actually a real thing that's caused by humans, he is much more willing to actually be accepting of the science mm -hmm. versus, you know, rejecting it. And I found that really interesting, and that, that I think that ties in a lot with the whole worldview thing. Have yeah. you all had similar experiences? What, what do you think about that? Yeah, that's my experience too. Is that when, a lot of times, like you'll correct somebody on a scientific point, you just have a discussion about what does the evidence show, what what is the science on this, and immediately they attach all sorts of political ideological assumptions to that, making assumptions about like what my politics are, for example, and. I, you have to make an effort to separate the two things. So let's just talk about what the facts are, what the science says, and not worry about the political or ideological implications of it. But people have a hard time separating those two. But I do agree that um, making a, a concerted effort to do that and to just stick with the science is helpful. It, it's also helpful to try to, to find common ground, you know, because you know, a lot of people, there is actually really high respect for science in the public. Oh, yeah. And Otherwise, creationists wouldn't try to call what they do right. creation That's why science. Every, right. right. They're all that, trying to yeah. take on the mantle of being scientific <clears throat> because people have there's a huge amount of respect for science and being scientific. Um, and so when you keep it in that realm, um, that's the arena where you want to have the discussion. Right? You don't want it to be the political ideological fight because you're probably never going to win that. You know, that's, people are, that's where they get defensive and that's where their opinions are already solidified. Okay. Yeah, and, and typically on, on uh, you know, talk shows, news shows, um, it's the same people representing the same positions. And the, the problem, I think, is that, is that the audience associates certain personalities with certain political positions. And when that person comes out arguing uh, that we need to take more action on, you know, regarding climate change, climate change or anything else, immediately there's a, there's a linkage made to that person's politics because that's the person they see representing that political position all the time. So, you know, there's not an awful lot of diversity in who gets, who gets airtime. But that's why I think, like, both the creationists and the global warming deniers went crazy when Neil deGrasse Tyson on Cosmos talked about evolution and climate change because he's very apolitical, and he, deliberately so. He, he, he wants to communicate science, and he doesn't want his message to be muddled by anything else, and that's, I, I totally respect that. And, but, so there he was representing just the scientific opinion, and that upset them a lot because they couldn't mm -hmm. say, well, he's just a whatever, because he isn't. He's just a scientist just telling us what the science that, is. That even merited him a cartoon on the cover of National Review. <laughs> right. if you, uh, he, he was... Um, I think the, the article, the tone of the article was um, the experts telling us what the truth is. Mm -hmm. In other words, you know, putting him in the light of, of being an arrogant person. Anybody who knows him knows he's, he's one of the least arrogant people you'll ever right. meet. Right. Yeah. Um, but he's very down to earth. <laughs> yeah, he is. <laughs> yeah. Barb, do you have any thoughts on that? I think I think they covered it really well. I, oh. I'm just sitting here nodding. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. I, di I didn't know if you wanted to interject. Um, okay, well... Um, we, we've been mentioning a lot about, for example, uh, creationism, global warming, denial, uh, and, and so on. 
but I mean, this, this is very this is this, this is a very general uh, kind of phenomenon. I think if you if you in, engage in discussion with anybody who is espousing a, a pseudo scientific view or a non scientific view or or, or something, you, you can run into this. Like, I think another another really good one to hit on here is the, the whole anti vaccination movement, and uh, and that's one of the reasons why I'm especially glad that you're here, Steve, because uh, this is kind of a big deal, I think, mm -hmm. um, and. Uh, I, and I and I and I think it's important. I can't remember one of you, but one of you said earlier, you know, and you said it very well. You know, whether you're coming from the left or the right politically or the middle, you know, you, there's this ideological baggage, so to speak. And oftentimes we talk about creationism and climate change denial, and sort of so sort of the political right gets a pretty bad rap on that, right? But I don't know. I think the anti-vaccination side is. Kind of a little on the other side, and uh, yeah, we have or, or, or is it? It's okay. not really. It's, it's really. Not. It's okay. both. So it's, it's both. Okay. It's 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 left and right. Um, oh. Okay. Yeah, which is simple actually. Like GMO is the same. It's kind of a bipartisan. Oh really? Issue. Okay. Yeah. I th yeah I thought that GMO was just really do really dominantly liberal, but there was, was one one survey about a year ago where it really didn't come out that way, which is surprising. Really? Okay. Uh, but I think that's because um, there the right is a complicated thing. It's not. Monolithic, and there's a libertarian component to that that doesn't trust the government, and so oh, there are anti-government okay. anti-vaxxers, and there are anti-corporate anti-vaxxers, and there are environmentalist anti-vaxxers, and so they're coming to this from different political okay. ideologies. So it kind of spreads out. If you're just looking left and right, it doesn't capture it. it doesn't capture ah, the landscape. Okay. So left right kind of becomes a false okay. dichotomy then. Um, so you, when you just look at, if you look at it from left to right, it looks like it's sort of on both sides, but that's because there's different components of the left and different components of the right that are buying into, ideologically buying into, you know, the anti-vaccine uh, position, for example. Um, so, but yeah, so that's one that isn't, you can't tar it as a, as a right-wing phenomenon. Or a left wing, but but it isn't. But it isn't left wing. It's just there's it's different. There's different. Kind of it's both. bipartisan, okay. actually, in a way. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, that's that's good to know. I didn't know that. So. But there definitely is a contingent on the left that is anti-vax. Right. Okay. Okay. Um, and are any others? I mean, that, that I mean, do we have any? Uh, do we have any other uh, areas that are maybe? pet peeves of yours in terms of this kind of science the, denial the, the that, are anti, pretty, that are pretty broad reaching in terms of societal effects. Speaking to anti-vaccine movement is one that just really blows my mind. It, it's because it's amazing to me because first of all, I wasn't under the, the impression that anybody really thought Jenny McCarthy was even respectable as an actress. <laughs> Ouch. Let, let alone as a scientist. So it's I, I don't know. It amazes me that that one is is. Uh, it's the mommy instinct, though. So she yeah. didn't. Yeah. She just, she just went with the instinct. yeah mommy instinct. Trump science. That was her shtick. Mm -hmm. Well, okay. So let, well, let's talk about that yeah. because um, you know we talked before about political ideology, worldview, and so on. And and David brought, and, and and Barbara, you brought up the point about identity. I mean, the, mm -hmm. the, the, this is well. What you're talking about, somebody as a mother or a, a father or a parent. Mm -hmm. That's that's it, that's digging pretty far down in terms of personal identity. Right. Now, I'm not a parent. I, uh, Darwin does not like me. <laughs> I've, it's okay. I, I but so I don't have that frame of reference. So I mean, in in terms of something like that, uh, so specific to the anti-vaccination yeah. and 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 mommy or daddy instinct. Um, Thoughts uh, from especially yeah. parents because I know Steve, I know Barbara, yeah. your parents. I don't know about you, David. But we all th yeah. we all think we know ourselves better, and we certainly think we know our kids better than anybody else does. And so, what, how could a doctor tell us, you know, otherwise? And what you're what you're looking at with with regard to the the mommy factor, there's a good reason why so many people think that vaccines cause autism. There are good reasons, and they see a correlation. It's an illusory correlation, but they see a correlation between giving their children vaccines and these and these symptoms appearing. Um, it it makes perfect sense from a, a logical standpoint when you when you look at it scientifically why that is, and and yet there's still no causal link. But to try to convince a parent that something that they saw with their own eyes mm -hmm. um, isn't true. It's not that what they saw, it's, the thing is, 
it's not what they saw that's not true, it's how they interpreted what they saw. And that's what we all have a difficult time letting go of, is that our interpretations and our opinions that we form from the little facts and things that we gather, we have a difficult time letting go of those because that's how our brains are built. Our brains are built to right. look for information that's going to help us. Mm -hmm. And it, they do that very, very well, very efficiently. It's just that they're not always correct. And, and to engage in the kinds of thinking that um, would allow us to come to a better conclusion or a more rational conclusion, we have to let go of some of those things. We have to let go of, we have to be able to hold what we believe kind of in a, in a sort of escrow while we consider alternative realities. And that can be kind of scary, you know? Because mm -hmm. if, you, if you're wrong about something, then, ha then do you, are you gonna have another truth to be able to grab onto? Sometimes there isn't yeah. another truth. Yeah, it's a, the hardest thing in the world is to get somebody to disbelieve their own experience. So I've had you know, a mother of a child who had autism tell me, there's nothing you can tell to me, tell me or show me that will change my mind. I know that my child's autism was caused by vaccines. That was it, 100%, there was nothing, no evidence could ever dissuade her of that opinion. Um, but the, the, when it comes to like medical uh, issues, the, the, the problem we run into is we, along those lines are that you know, people are convinced by stories and by experience and not by numbers on a page. Right. But the reality is that if you make decision based upon dry, cold numbers, your chances of having a good outcome are optimized. That's what you want to do. But that just feels so wrong. And people don't want to practice, you know, make decisions based upon cold data. That's what keeps Vegas in business. Yeah, exactly. It's, yeah. It, Vegas would not be in business if people made rational number-based decisions. Yeah. But the, the people if, who run the casinos are making the rational yes. number-based decisions. And they want, they encourage irrational. They wish you luck because they want you to think that luck exists. They want right. you to, they want you to believe in the irrationality. In medicine, that leads people to thinking that there's, they just feel that there's something unnatural, or there's, some, you know, they're injecting their kids with these toxins, and that just resonates with them instinctively and no, no numbers are going to convince them that, that those instincts are not true. You really need the ability to step back from everything you feel and everything you've been told and look at it in a sort of a, in a analytical scientific way and that's not something that we're in, born to do. That's something that's a, that's a very much a learned behavior that not many, and, and, not and many people have. This, this dovetails with <coughs> the dynamic um, that the internet presents us with, which is you're looking for people out in the world who can resonate with your experience. You know, we're talking about parents, who, particularly, I mean, I have three kids, none of which thankfully are, are autistic. I can't imagine what it's like to be a parent of an autistic child, but I can imagine that if I did have one, I would be diving into as much knowledge, you know, that I could find and, you know, whether it was good or bad, I would, I would be trying to find something that I could anchor myself to and I think typically what that ends up being is is people sharing their experiences and you know unfortunately um, it, well I think that's a very good thing I think it's a it's a great dynamic that the internet gives us I think a lot of the knowledge that you know pervades the forums and so forth is skewed is not you know it's it's leading people in the wrong direction but because it's the knowledge that seems to be get you know gets repeated it's the the thing is that Jenny McCarthy you know. Well, it's not just sharing experiences; it's also sharing outrage. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Well, it's it, and it's it goes to the point that Steve was making. It's it's the sharing of the the feelings, the emotions, and and and, and the narrative. And they the have narrative. a narrative. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And in their narrative, they are the heroes and the victims, and we are the villains. Or science is the villain, and that's a very powerful narrative, and it colors everything that they see. And you know, so you see these echo chambers on the online where the narrative holds sway, and there's again, it's, there's, it's immune to evidence because first you would have to really get them to step back from a, a very well-developed, elaborate, culturally and you know socially reinforced narrative, and it's it's you know you're not going to do it with facts. It's you, you know it, so it's kind of a no-win scenario once once that develops. That's why I think you know, the internet is such a double-edged sword because 
um, while it gives us access to information, it, it gives us access to the information that's likely to reinforce what we already believe. And in fact, sometimes it's institutionalizing confirmation bias. You know, with, you can go to websites like, you know, Age of Autism, go to the comments there, and you, there's a culture of people who have their own sort of, their own cultural norms about what's acceptable, and you don't challenge parents about their beliefs, and et cetera. It's all meant to reinforce this narrative that they have, this shared narrative that they have, and it's, it has nothing to do with the science. So that brings me to my last question for the panel, and then we can get to audience questions. Uh, just to point out, I believe we have, yes, we have a microphone right there. So if uh, in, a, in a few minutes, if you have a question for anyone on the panel or the panel in general, you can feel free to queue up there. Uh, so my last question for the panel, and this gets to something that Steve was just mentioning. Okay, well, how do you, how, how do you, uh, how, how do we, we potentially respond to this? I mean, um, how, w when you're faced with these uh, uh, these types of pseudoscience or, 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 or abusive science beliefs that could have societal consequences and so on and so forth, whether it's you know, climate change denial, anti-vaccination, whatever, how, how can we respond effectively to that? Uh, thoughts. Start a podcast. <laughs> oh, <laughs> write a blog. I, I, think I heard you, you did something. Like I that. think yeah. you have to teach science literacy <clears throat> and critical thinking literacy together. Um, one or the other is not enough. You need to under have a certain basic working knowledge of science, but you also that that by itself isn't enough either. You need to have a certain critical thinking literacy. You need to have some ability to understand. Um, the way the way the human psyche works to step back from your own beliefs, you know, the metacognition to think about your own processes of how you come to beliefs and decisions. Thinking and about thinking. Them. Thinking about thinking. Yeah. So, and that's that's you know that's not easy. That's that's a that takes a long time to develop even a basic level sort of of skills there. But you know, we just have to keep hammering away at that. You know, and, and advocate for it at every level of education and lifelong. There's got to be lifelong learning in science and critical thinking. And I think really nothing short of that is going to have a huge impact. Okay. Other thoughts? Uh, yeah, I, I agree with that. And I think we have to. It was brought up earlier. We have to, as science communicators, we have to constantly be looking for ways to connect the science to what's going on in people's lives. It has to be applicable to them. A lot of times, these topics get talked about in a vacuum, or they get talked about in a very kind of you know, 30,000 foot level. And, you know, the average person just doesn't see the connection. They don't see why they need to pay attention to that level of detail. There has to be a way that we connect it with what's going on in people's lives and making it relevant to them so that they will pay attention. And that opens it, you know, and then that opens the door to what Steve's talking about, you know, a greater level, you know, heightened ability to, to think critically about these things and then be more open to the actual science. I actually think we need to do more than teach uh, science and science literacy because um, that's not going to reach the large numbers that we need. And, and I think we need cultural shifts in, it, similar to what you were saying about, um, you know, gay marriage is now much, mm -hmm. much, much more accepted. That's a huge cultural shift. And to be perfectly honest, there's a, there's huge shifts are needed in these areas where we're still in denial or where there's a large, there's a large proportion of the population still in denial. And I honestly think that the best way to achieve those shifts um, as quickly as possible is to um, spread the word that people believe it. And there's there's a lot of research recently, uh, particularly about things like um, anti-vax, um, that more people will vaccinate if they get the idea that other people are vaccinating. When you talk mm -hmm. about high vaccination rates, people are more convinced that it's the way to go um, because they're looking for a consensus of, of a social consensus. Um, they want to know what other people think, not, and it doesn't necessarily have to be, this is what science says. It can be, this is what everyone else is doing. Um, yep. And I, we could focus on those things as well while we're trying to spread science literacy, but I think science literacy, literacy is only going to go so far. Well, and I think it's a good point to illustrate that, this, that none of this occurs in a vacuum, and there is, all, there is a social con uh, con uh, context to it. Um, and uh, and uh, on the anti-vax angle, uh, I, 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 think, you know, I, think, I think how we communicate is just as important as what we communicate. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I think there is something to be said for 
learning how to properly message uh, the, the teaching of science and stuff. So I'll just I'll just end with a with a with a, with a little thing that uh, um, a, a mark of pride of mine is that I I helped uh, I worked with the JREF and and, and, and when thinking organi organization a couple of years ago we did some anti-vaccination research and stuff and we found that messaging is really important and we found that a phrase to encourage those fence sitters to to um, to vaccinate children goes something like this. It's like, well, if you put your child in a car, you would play the odds and put them in a car seat, wouldn't you? Mm -hmm. And stuff like that. I mean, not judgmental, not, 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 but just kind of putting it in another context and, and, and in a more gentle way. And that actually, that sort of messaging, the way of communicating can be really powerful, but it's hard to figure out how to do that. <laughs> Right. Well, and I think I that think has to be part of it too. Focusing on all of the the horrible people who who are sending the wrong message, you know, isn't necessarily going to help. Is it? Right. It's, it's not. It's not going to be quite as effective as focusing on the message of look at how great vaccines are and what they do, right. and how they help, you know, yeah. so. millions of other people. So I, in some ways, it, that's kind of tough for skeptics because we like to talk about <laughs> we like to say, things that are we wrong like to, we and like not the things that are smack. right. Yeah, we yeah. like to talk smack about Jenny McCarthy. And it's very yeah. difficult to change that, that yeah. frame. It, I, I haven't figured out how to do that yeah. myself. That's our bias. critical yeah. by, na by yeah. nature. So. But also, you know, I think we have a certain dedication to intellectual honesty and the truth, and yeah. the other side often doesn't. You know, they have a huge advantage. That's why you think like the anti-vaccine movement, like green your vaccines and too many too soon, they have really good slogans that are very effective, and we don't. And uh, uh, do we just suck at it, or is it there's well, something, well, I think we're tying one hand behind our backs, because, but I think we have to. I don't think there's any way around it. I think we, there's only so much framing and messaging can go when you still have to be honest and truthful in what yes. the information you give, where as opposed to if the message is everything, that gives you a little bit of freedom to craft right. optimal messaging. Um, so well, I think we're always, be gonna be, we're always going to be working yeah. in, in a disadvantage because it's harder to work within a framework of the truth rather than just whatever messaging works. You know. Okay. Um, do we have any questions from the audience? Oh, okay, feel free to you got to line up right here at the uh, at the microphone, just one person at a time, and. Uh, Please make sure that you are asking a question, and please keep it brief because we only have eight minutes left. So, yes, sir. Concise. All right, I'll give you, um, uh, first of all, thank you, Stephen. Uh, some great information over the last three years on uh, skeptical sure. thinking. Um, I guess it comes down to trust, right? I, I can look at evolution and say, okay, I can see a progression and some evidence there or whatever, and it looks like, you know, the birds are changing or whatever. But then I look at global warming, and I'm, I'm an old fart. So I remember back in the 70s, you guys were talking about global cooling, right? And uh, now we're talking about global warming. And everybody with a report puts out a new thing every year about this is what's going to happen next year or 10 years from now or whatever. And the 10 years go by, and it's not as bad as they think, right? Or from a vaccine point of view, there's... Question in there? Yeah, a question what's, in there. what's the question? Why, why should I trust... Every year, another set of predictions, right? It's like the weatherman, and, and I'm a very scientific person. I'm very skeptical about everything. I bought property in Arizona and Canada, <laughs> right? Um, literally. Cover your bases, right? Baby seat, right? So why should I trust another set of global warming predictions that really haven't panned out too much in the last 50 years? Because i got to look at it from, a, from a, a huge scale, not just a what happened last year, or how many storms we had this okay. month. Okay, fair yeah. question. I think, you know, so again, part of the problem gets back to what I said earlier about getting your information from secondary sources, including the media. And if, you're, if you listen to the media, it looks like the scientists are bouncing all over the place. Like they're saying, this, you know, this year one thing is good for you, then it's bad for you the next year. But that, that's because they're giving a very hyped, uh, premature, and inaccurate version of what, what's actually happening behind the scenes with the scientists who and are much one more... One study concerned. at a time, too. Yeah, it's like one, one study, study at a time. time. The, the scientists are going much more conservatively, much more slowly. The opinions evolve more over time as evidence accumulates. So don't trust that journalist version of science where they're bouncing all over the place. So that, that's one issue. And the other one does get to... It, it's hard to know who to trust. 
Um, so I, I would say just look at as many different sources as you can. I don't think there's any one source that's going to ever be definitive or authoritative. But when you start to see a consensus of opinion, and not just like what are they saying, but who has the more you know coherent and uh, um, you know logical, definitive uh, approach to things, you, you know a, a, a consensus does can emerge from that information. But you know again, my experience is. That takes that takes a fair amount of work, um, unless you have it's, unless there's you know unless it's you, worth it though. It's I think worth it. If, if the questions yeah. are important enough, yeah. it's, it's worth it. Yeah. So I mean, predicting the future is a sort of a special subset of science, and, and it's inherently um, uh, difficult to do. And but again, you know, scientists should be very conservative in making projections into the future. So. Do, you know, you may be, can be getting misinformation about how confident the scientists were in their projections, and you know, as they're refining their models, they're you know, they're they're partly responding. What did we predict? What happened? Okay, let's refine our models and make it better. And the the error bars are narrowing over time. So you have to look at those pro projections in terms of the error bars, not what was the bottom line that they were predicting, because that's, again, not how the science works. So I think it's still just a, the media is giving a misrepresentation of how the science is actually working. Uh, next question. Okay, very quickly. I am not a parent. The parents that I do know are not anti-vaxxers, so this whole thing is just <clears throat> fascinating to me. You said that there, people form this correlation in their mind um, with what they see in this anti-vaccination opinion. So can you just give one or two examples of what sort of correlation is there that they even see that's not true? I just, I don't have any experience with that. I was just very curious about that. Okay. It, it's mostly timing. Um, the, about the time that, that uh, symptoms of autism start to appear is, you know, after children have, shortly after children have received a lot of, a lot of vaccinations in early childhood. So there's this, this correlation in time um, and it, the, the, the problem is, is that you see that same, those symptoms show up in unvaccinated children at around the same time. So, you know, there's a lot of research to show that it, it was a good hypothesis. It was actually a reasonable hypothesis to have. You see this, this happening and then you test it and find out if, it, if there is a causal link. And study after study after study has failed to, to show that there's a causal link. So, oh. Thank you. Yes, three birthday uh, cakes. Yeah, causes that's <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a wow, that's a great that's a that's another correlation. Three or four birthday cakes, birthday cakes, you get autism. So, wow, uh, I'm gonna remember that's the that main one. one. I mean, I think there's others, but <laughs> that was that's good. Certainly, I'll, I'll be willing to eat those birthday cakes to test that. Aha, uh, uh -huh, yum. Yeah. Okay, question. All right, uh, yeah, so today we're talking about like here, you know, climate change and, and evolution of vaccines. If we had had the same panel 50 years ago, there might have been different issues. 50 years in the future, there might be totally different issues that people are misinformed about that still have a lot of political traction. Is the best we can do as skeptics play whack-a-mole, basically, when a misinformation pops up, we try to knock it down? Got or it. is there a way to address a root problem of public at large not understanding their own cognitive uh, uh, Get you know, back problems? with us in a couple decades. <laughs> yeah, well... I don't... Uh, That's a huge question. Anyone? Um, yeah, I, I think... We're trying. Well, one constant... Although forms of media change, media has existed, you know, through, throughout that entire span and will continue, obviously. We need to be teaching people to be more media savvy, I think. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's, you know, the way information is presented makes all the difference in whether um, it's adopted or whether it's rejected, whether, it, you know, it's fed into a confirmation <laughs> bias on one side or the other side. You know, there, there's, there's things, I think as skeptics, you know, instead of being so disgruntled as we often are about how um, things get spun in the media, and there's certainly a lot to be legitimately annoyed about with that, we should be we should be focusing on how to to educate people towards figuring out that puzzle. You know, deconstructing it so that you know there's less ambiguity and there's more. Focus and and I also it. think we should highlight when the media does it right. Like for example, with, with when the BBC came out and, and said, you know, we're gonna we're not gonna do this equal time thing anymore, that was great. I mean, that was huge. Uh, and and I think what we need to do is we need to we need to point to positive developments like that and say, that's the way to do it, right. uh, as as opposed to just constantly you know, ballyhooing, you know, oh, well, they're just doing it wrong. But again, that kind of goes to our own our own bias as to how we think about these things. At least in my mind. 
Um, okay, next question, sir. <laughs> so we have one minute, so this will yeah, probably be the last really question. Quick. Uh, general practitioners, uh, because of the way the insurance system set up, have very little time to actually sit and talk to their patients, and uh, you know maybe five minutes if they're lucky. Uh, how does that lead into some of these things like uh, uh, anti-vax movement, uh, alternative medicine, and uh, how can that be addressed? Yeah, it's a huge problem. You know, I mean, the, the system is under a lot of pressure, and patient education is can easily get squeezed out. But there are, you know. We're doing our best in that there are physician extenders, for example, whose their sole job is to do the patient education, and that model works well. You can also point patients to you know, information. You don't necessarily have to tell them face-to-face -face as the same set of information that you're going to give 100 patients. You could say, here's a pamphlet or here's a site online with all the information, and when I see you back next time, we'll talk about any questions that you have about it. Or you can set up an appointment with the nurse practitioner and they'll discuss with you any questions you have once you've digested all the information. So there's definitely ways to improve that, and a lot of practices do do that. You know, when you, and when you survey people about why they you know, um, are anti-vax or use alternative medicine or complementary modalities, they don't say because they're not happy with their doctor, actually. That's, that's way, way, way down on the list. They, they, it's mainly for ideological reasons or just because of the anecdotes. They heard good things. The media made them open to it. But it's not because of that or other problems because, you know, we're, we're aware those problems exist and there are, you know, are very commonsensical approaches to, to improve it. Unfortunately, we are out of time. However, if you still have a question, um, feel free to approach the table and we'll be around for a couple of minutes. Uh, everyone, thank you, thank you, thank you for coming to the panel. Let's give a hand to our panelists and let's give another hand uh, to the organizers here. This is great. Thank you very much. Have a good rest of the con. Thank you.